Welcome to Sunday School for July 5th. Goodness, it's hard to believe that we're already in July. Uh, today we're going to be talking about repentance and forgiveness. Such wonderful, easy, and light topics for the day. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, I think it's just human tendency to want to try to get away with something. You know, from uh, the time that we're little children, uh, we have a tendency to want to deny and deflect and blame other people for our own wrongdoings. And I think that's, uh, I think that's just a human thing that we want to do that. But uh, the divine way, the God way of looking at, at life and looking at our sin is repentance. And the wonderful thing about it is, is that there's always forgiveness there from God. What I think is interesting, too, is that oftentimes, um, if we want to be close to God, if we really want to act like God, uh, then what we need to do is forgive each other. And God help us forgive ourselves. You know, I grew up in uh, the Pentecostal tradition, so I didn't grow up as a Methodist. And so I jokingly say that I have enough guilt for about three people. Uh, so, you know, um, this uh, the song for today, which is Psalm 51, really resonates with me a good bit, somewhat because of that, um, and others just because I, I need it. But, uh, you know, I also saw this, uh, recently I saw a New Yorker cartoon. I love New Yorker cartoons. If you know me at all, you know that, that I love them and I have them in various places. But uh, one, of them, one of them that I saw recently has this man, he's talking to his wife, and he says, the hardest thing to do is to forgive yourself. And I've done that. So I don't understand why you can't forgive me too. Uh, but it is. Sometimes the hardest thing is, is to forgive ourselves. Well, let's uh, look at that, that, that little uh, superscript, that uh, introduction to Psalm 51. So grab your Bibles and let's look at Psalm 51. But I want you to also hold your place in your Bible at 2 Samuel 11 and 12. Because we've got to go back almost immediately to that. Well, of course, Psalm 51 starts out with this little introduction that says, For the director of music, a psalm of David. And then it has this historical um, section that says, uh, When the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. There are not very many of these little historical markers in the psalms. But here we have a good one. We all know that story of David and Bathsheba. It's one of the most famous uh, stories in the life of David uh, and in the whole of uh, the Old Testament. Um, of course, this is all in 2 Samuel chapter 11, and you can go there if you want. Um, we're going to read a few verses, but I'm just going to give you the, the nuts and bolts of the story. Of course, we know David was at home in Jerusalem, and he so he wasn't really where he was supposed to be, and he was out on the... Uh, on the roof of his house, or his palace, I guess, and he saw a woman bathing, and he uh, he called for her to come to him. And it's like whenever the king comes call, comes a calling, you don't you don't say oh, sorry, I, I'm I'm going to stay home. Uh, so she came to him, and of course he gave her the how you doing, and I guess she fell for uh, fell for David, and they had an affair. And of course, we know that affair ended up in um, in a child uh, being conceived, and so you know the story goes was that she was married to Uriah the Hittite, uh, who was with Joab, uh, the commander of David's army in in Ammonite territory. And so David calls Joab and says to, to, says to him to bring to send Uriah home. Well, he sends Uriah home, and Uriah is like the nicest of people, the noblest of men, strongest of character, and he just won't go home. You know, David is trying to hide over his sin, uh, but uh, Uriah won't play along. And so what does David do? Uriah sends, uh, uh, David sends Uriah back to the front, the front lines, and he sends a letter with him to say, basically, stick him up front so that he gets killed. 
And sure enough, when the battle rages, Uriah is sent to the front and he is killed. And so David thinks that he has gotten away with murder and with other things. You know, all this he thinks that he's gotten away with. But the very last verse of chapter 11, it's verse 27, it says, But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. So he thought he was getting away with all of these grievous sins and all because he was the king. He had the power to do that. But God knew and wasn't happy about it. Well, then if we look in 2 Samuel chapter 12, just the first dozen or so verses, it says, The Lord sent Nathan to David. Now, Nathan was a prophet. And Nathan, when he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. It's very rare in the Old Testament that we have a true parable like the ones that Jesus told, but this really is a parable. Now going on, though, David... Uh, David is furious, He's, and it says in verse 5, David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who, must, who, who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. You know, it's interesting just how judgmental we can be whenever we are dealing with sin of our own. Well, that's what David is doing right here. It's like he has forgotten what he did and is judging this other. Well, Nathan is not going to have any of that. So in verse 7, then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah, and if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. So, you know, David is completely transparent. He is caught in the lies. He's caught in the sin. And rather than trying to avoid it, because at this point, how are you going to do that? There's no way to avoid dealing with the consequences of his sin. And it's interesting, too, that Nathan begins to enumerate all of these different consequences. And there are awful consequences that are going to happen as a result. What's interesting to me is that, you know, sometimes we think of forgiveness as being a catch-all, and it's like, oh good, it's all over. It doesn't mean that the consequences are not there, or that we don't live with them. But thank God that David is transparent. He throws himself uh, at the feet of God and asks for mercy from the very beginning. Well, then that is the nutshell version of the story that sets up Psalm 51. So let's go ahead and start looking at that. Psalm 51, verse 1, it says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. There are a couple of words here that are so important uh, to understanding what he's talking about. One is that is what is translated as unfailing love. That's really one word in Hebrew. It's hesed. Hesed is, um, is unfailing love. It is loving kindness. It is mercy. It is uh, loyal love. I don't know about you, but oftentimes when we think about uh, 
our, our life with God, we think about how that it's important for us to be loyal to God, but do we ever think about the fact that God is loyal to us, even in the midst of, of times when we know we are not in the right relationship that we ought to be in with God. God is still loyal. God is still faithful. He faithfully loves us. And then it says, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. I mean, this is true repentance. This is to, looking for real forgiveness. But that compassion is the same kind of tender care that we might use when taking care of a baby. An infant that does not that's so vulnerable and is you know is unable to take care of itself that's the kind of compassion that God has for us verse 2 wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. You know, I mentioned that I have a whole lot of guilt. Um, I always jokingly say, uh, if you've met my mother, you would know why I have so much guilt. <laughs> if you're listening to this, you, you, know, it's, you know it's true. Uh, but uh, at least what, what David gets to here is that he's not trying to hide anything. He knows everything. I don't know about you, but uh, I know people, people do not believe it, but I really am an introvert. And one of the, one of the things that, that wakes me up in the middle of the night is something that I did 30 years ago. And I thought, I'm thinking, you know, I really shouldn't have said that to that person that one time. That I, and I never met them again. This is the kind of thing that bothers me, you know? It wakes me up in the middle of the night, you know, no purpose whatsoever. Guilt, uh, guilt and aggravation over dumb things that don't really matter. But this matters. Dave, what, David, what David is talking about matters. And he says, against you, you only I have sinned, in, in verse 4. And I think that's such an odd thing. If this is supposed to be in reference to uh, this sin with Bathsheba and with Uriah, I mean, we're talking about adultery, we're talking about murder, and then, of course, eventually the death of the child that David and Bathsheba have together. I mean, this, this, that's a lot of consequences and a lot of things that are happening on the human level. But the thing is, is that even as important as those are, and they're important, uh, what is even more significant is that the break in the relationship between the human and the divine characters, between David and between God. I think it's important for us to uh, learn forgiveness. And, and who do we learn forgiveness from? We learn it from God. He, he did it first. He understands it better than any of us. Verse 5, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now granted, I don't think that David was a sinner in the womb. Although there was a uh, there was a, a Jewish way of thinking uh, uh, back in uh, at least at the, by the time of Jesus that said that basically that you could sin prior to uh, being born. I don't think that's true. I really don't. Uh, and I think what David is getting at is that he's always been a sinner, just like we've always been sinners. We've never been uh, never been very good at being good. You know I. Uh, I try my best not to tell stories about my children, but, but you know, our middle child, she was a firecracker when she was little in particular, and I remember one, at one point, I think she bit her older sister. She was a biter. It was good times back then, yes. And what, what, was, what was funny to me is that, of course, you know, my wife it sets her in front of her sister and she says, you need to tell her you're sorry. That's what, you know, that's what parents do. And so she said, now you say it after me. I said, I, I. And of course she has her arms crossed like this, as frustrated and aggravated. Am. Am. Sorry. Not sorry. <laughs> and so that's, we don't need to be taught how to be little sinners. We, we know how to do that early on. And so I don't, but I don't think that that's what, what David is getting at, that he's saying that, uh, that he sinned before birth, 
uh, but that we're all born as sinners. It goes on, verse 6, Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Now, when he talks about womb and the secret place, you know, it's not the normal word, Hebrew word for womb that, that is used there. You know, it parallels that, that, that phrase, secret place. And so David is making a comparison here. Uh, you know, he's saying, you know, the secret place is, is my inner self, my inner being. And, of course, that's what we need to get under control. Uh, it's where, but it's also where faithfulness and uh, wisdom are nurtured, um, and forgiveness. Verse 7, he says, Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. You know, hyssop is a, it, it's an odd plant. You know, it's a plant. It has hairy leaves, and so it will haul liquids. And so, of course, in the Passover ritual, the first one in particular, uh, the blood of the lamb, was dipped, you know, was put in a basin, and then hyssop leaves uh, started around, and then used it as a paintbrush to paint on the lintels, the doorposts uh, of the doors of the Israelites in Egypt. Well, of course, hyssop became a part of the ritual of forgiveness and repentance for for the Jew, for the Judeans uh, during uh, the Old Testament times. And, uh, of course, this cleansing, cleansing with hyssop, and I will be clean, wash me, and I will be whiter than snow, this is pointing ahead for us to Christ's work on the cross, cleansing us of all sin. What a great joy there is in knowing that even when we fail, even when we falter, that we have someone who has already forgiven us, and we just need to accept it. Verse 8, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. And then we get to the crux of this entire psalm that says, verse 10, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. There are two great words here. Create and renew. Create. Think about it like this. David is saying that I need a totally new heart. I need something completely created anew. That word create is the same word that is used in Genesis to talk about how that God created something brand new out of nothing. Well, David realizes that he needs that. He needs a renewal in his spirit, a renewal in his heart that is akin to something totally new. And remember that God is in the business of creation and in business of recreation. He recreates us. That's his whole reason for us to be here, is to recreate the world in his image. And then he goes on in verse 11. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. When he says, do not cast me away, that is the same word uh, that we could, we, we might say fling, violently fling away, throw away, throw out, like we would the garbage, and something that we, that we despise. That's how serious he's taking this. And then he says, your, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Remember, David's predecessor as king was Saul, and Saul uh, got into such a bad relationship with, with God that his spirit moved away from him. And David, of course, is saying, I don't want this sin that I have committed to cause that, such a rupture in our relationship that your spirit is not with me. Thanks be to God that we always have his spirit with us because of Christ's work on the cross and because he sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. But, you know, oftentimes we are not aware completely of the Holy Spirit uh, at work in our life or even just being there because we are oftentimes living in sin or even more so living in unforgiveness. I don't know about you, but... Uh, I can forgive, but it's hard to forget. 
and, and you know, and sometimes I don't know where I stand on that sometimes, you know. But uh, what I do know is that forgiveness is a gift. Forgiveness is a gift from God. It is also a gift that we can give to each other. And like I said before, sometimes we have to give it to ourselves as well. As well, you know, when someone has wronged us and truly repents, we can give them forgiveness. And think about this too, it's not that it makes what they did go away, or that it makes it, okay, everything is fine, everything is great, it, it, it doesn't do that. And, and you know, another thing too is we give forgiveness not because somebody deserves it, but because they need it, they need it so bad. And, and truthfully, when you've been wronged, you need to forgive just as much as that person needs to be forgiven. I mean, how, how do you go on living in unforgiveness? I mean, many of us do it, and we try very, very, very well to, to, to do that. But the thing is, is that what, what does unforgiveness lead to? It leads to bitterness. And, and, I, I know all of us know somebody or have known someone, or maybe it's us, who, who have been made bitter as a result of something that's happened in a relationship or um, in the world, or God forbid, even in our relationship with God sometimes. It's like we, we don't think things have turned out the way that they should or that we had planned, and, and we get bitter. But, you know, bitterness, uh, you know, the old adage is that bitterness, bitterness is like taking a poison and expecting the other person to die. Well, you know, it's just going to kill us. It's just going to kill us. And so if we want to be like God, which I think we all want to be like him, we want to be like Christ, what, what does Christ do in the moment of his greatest agony? He forgives those who are hurting him. He forgives those who are crucifying him, even saying they don't know what they're doing. And that's the thing that we must do, is that we must learn to forgive just as our Father in Heaven has forgiven us. But what's even better, though, is what happens as a result of being forgiven and of giving forgiveness. Verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then he gives other things that he can do in order to show his gratefulness, his gratitude for being forgiven. Verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God my Savior and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The thing about it is, is that offerings are wonderful. Sacrifice is, is wonderful. But sacrifice without the right repentant heart and repentant forgiving attitude means nothing. So for us, that's all that matters is that we have the intent uh, to forgive, that we have the intent to repent, that we do it, that we really change the way that we are doing our lives, the way that we are working in this world. Verse 17, my sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise broken and, con and contrite. That means renewed from within and purged of any self-righteousness. See, in forgiveness and in repentance, there is no room for self-righteousness. There is no room for making yourself look not quite as bad as the other guy. There is no room for that. What there is room for is humility. And what do we get in, in response to that humility? We get forgiveness. We get compassion. We have that loyal chesed love. Verse 18, May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. 
let us today offer ourselves on the altar to our Lord as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That is our reasonable act of worship. And let's pray. And as we pray, um, I have a song for us today that repeats those words, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Let's sing together. 